Hello and good morning, everyone. I just want to welcome you to our Survive and Thrive webinar series. My name is Kelly Condon. I am the program coordinator for the Texas Oncology Foundation. Today, we um, are thrilled to have Monica Bryant here with us, and she's going to be discussing avoiding financial toxicity with us. If you are new to these webinar series, I just want to give you a little bit of background on our foundation. We are the Texas Oncology Foundation, and our mission is to provide support to cancer patients in the communities where they live, work, and receive treatment. And these Survive and Thrive programmings, like our webinars and our symposiums, um, is just one of the ways that we are active in local Texas communities, providing that support to everyone on the cancer journey. I want to go over a few housekeeping uh, tips just for this Zoom platform. If you are new to the Zoom platform and you're a first time user, please be reassured that we cannot see or hear you, but you can see and hear us um, throughout the presentation. If you are having any technical difficulties, like the slides don't seem to be advancing or you're losing um, signal most of the time, the best solution is just to exit and then rejoin the webinar. If you're experiencing audio issues, you can always choose to dial in to listen from a phone line, and the dial-in option is provided on the registration confirmation email that you received after you registered. We would love to hear from you throughout this presentation, and so if you have questions um, for our speaker over any of the content, if you hover, I believe it should be on, um, the bottom of your screen or sometimes it's at the top of the zoom screen but there is a Q&A uh, tab button if you click on that you can send us in your questions throughout the entire presentation we are not gonna interrupt the presentation but we will host a Q&A session at the end lastly we are recording this and so the online archive will be available for viewing after this live version um, and the recording will also be shared with everyone who registered in a follow-up email, and it'll also be available on our website, texasoncologyfoundation.org. And it's under our programs tab, and then you'll find the Survive and Thrive webinar archive listed there. We are also um, streaming live on Facebook, so I wanna welcome everyone tuning in from our Facebook page. Um, and if for some reason you do have to exit for a minute, and you're unable to come back into the live session, go to our Facebook page. We are streaming live there so you can still uh, catch up on what has been presented on. Like I mentioned earlier, we have Monica Bryant here with us today, and she is a cancer rights um, attorney, speaker, and author, and she is joining us from Triage Cancer, and she is the chief operating officer there. Triage Cancer is a national nonprofit that provides education on the practical and legal issues that may impact individuals diagnosed with cancer, as well as their caregivers, loved ones, anyone on that uh, journey with them. So Monica, thank you so much for just taking time to share with us today. Um, I know I've been very eager to hear from you, and I know this is just a topic that many um, could always, you know, learn more about. And so thank you for being with us today. And so I'm going to give it over to you and let you take it over. Thank you so much. I'm absolutely delighted to be on today uh, talking about financial toxicity. So as Kelly mentioned, uh, I co-founded an organization called Triage Cancer, and we are a national nonprofit. And we provide education and resources on all of the legal and practical issues that may impact individuals who are diagnosed with cancer and their caregivers. And so throughout today's presentation, you're going to see links um, and I'm going to point you to other places on our website because even though we're going to spend an hour together today, we're really just going to scratch the surface. So uh, in 2013, researchers out of Duke coined the term financial toxicity. And in their research, they focused on the financial burden of a cancer diagnosis and how significant that burden can be, not just in an acute way when somebody's in active treatment, but also the long-term impact of that financial burden. 
And this isn't necessarily just about somebody's bank account or financial health. We also have data on how that financial burden is causing stress and depression and anxiety and overall lowering somebody's quality of life. Now, this is a relatively new term, but it is certainly not a new problem. So if it's been a problem for many years, why haven't we been able to deal with the financial toxicity of a cancer diagnosis? The best answer I have is that there's no easy solution because there are multiple contributing factors to financial toxicity. And all of the factors, or at least most of them, have to be addressed in order to effectively mitigate the financial toxicity of a cancer diagnosis. Now, the number one culprit of the financial hardship that individuals face after a cancer diagnosis is health insurance status. And it's not just about does someone have health insurance or not, but it's about do they have the right health insurance policy for them? Certainly, in addition to health insurance, somebody. So does somebody have to stop for a period of time or stop working altogether? And how does that impact somebody's finances? And then all of the things that happen in life that would normally impact somebody's finances continue to occur even after a cancer diagnosis. So moving, relationship changes, graduating from school, all of those things are gonna compound the financial toxicity of a cancer diagnosis. Now, this is a visualization of many of the questions that can be asked of somebody to help address financial toxicity. And as you can see, it touches several aspects of somebody's life from health insurance to work, to practical issues, to what does their life look like? Now, I recognize that this is hard to see on a slide, but if you see at the bottom, there is a link that will take you to the full size version of this, of what we refer to as our checklist to avoid financial toxicity. And when you find the full size version, it's available for free on our website. You can download it and print it. You'll see on the left hand side of the sheet, it asks you all of these questions. And on the right hand side, it provides all of the resources that we have at Triage Cancer to help you deal with the answers to the questions. So I highly recommend that you take a look at that at your convenience. Now, we know that health insurance status is the primary contributing factor to financial toxicity. So theoretically, that would be an easy thing for us to solve. The problem is, Health insurance in this country is so complicated that Americans simply don't understand how it works or how to choose a plan. This study was done asking individuals in America if they could define the four most common health insurance terms. And the results showed only 4% could actually define all of the terms. That means 96% of Americans were buying something that they didn't actually understand. And then we know from the same study that only 40% of Americans said they were very confident in choosing the right policy. So it stands to reason that if we don't understand the terms and we don't know how to choose a policy, how can we be sure that we're picking the right policy for us to minimize that financial toxicity? So I wanna start off with the basics to make sure that we're all on the same page because even though some of you may understand all of these terms, we know from the research, so many Americans don't. In this country, there are three places we get health insurance. The largest number of Americans get their health insurance from an employer. The next largest group gets their health insurance from the government, primarily through Medicare and Medicaid. And the smallest number of Americans get their insurance directly from a health insurance company. But regardless of where you get your health insurance, there are some basic terms that are very important for us to understand. So when we're talking about health insurance costs, there's a cost just to have the health insurance and that's your monthly premium. And you're gonna pay this monthly whether or not you go to the doctor. It's like having car insurance all year, but never getting into an accident. So that's your monthly premium. 
Then there are some costs that you're going to incur when you actually go and use your health insurance. The first is your deductible. That is a fixed dollar amount that you're going to have to pay each year. Now that dollar amount is gonna depend on your policy. So some plans have a $300 deductible. Some plans have a $5,000 deductible. Some plans even have a $0 deductible. But again, it's what you have to pay each year out of pocket before your health insurance company starts picking up their share of the costs. Their share of the costs is referred to as your coinsurance or your cost share. Now, one of the challenges with explaining or teaching about health insurance is there are often multiple terms to explain exactly the same thing. So this is our first example of that. So coinsurance and cost share are exactly the same thing. And it's gonna be presented to you as a percent. Again, it's gonna depend on your policy, but many plans have an 80-20 cost share, which means that once you've met your deductible, your health insurance company will pick up 80% of the costs of your medical care and you'll pay the other 20%. Now, many policies also have an additional payment called a co-payment. And again, this is a fixed dollar amount that you're going to pay each time you get care. The specific dollar amount is gonna depend on your policy. So it's very common for policies to have a $25 co-payment each time you see the doctor or a $35 copayment to see a specialist, or a $250 copayment to go to the emergency room. Now, the last thing I wanna talk about with respect to costs here is your out-of-pocket maximum. Now, I would argue that this is one of the most important things for you to understand about your health insurance policy, because theoretically, it is the most you're going to pay out-of-pocket for your medical care each year. And the way you get to your out-of-pocket maximum typically is by adding up everything you pay towards your deductible, everything you've paid towards your copayment, and everything you pay towards your coinsurance. So it's everything you pay out-of-pocket except those monthly premiums. Now, of course, the devil's in the details. So typically, out-of-pocket maximums are only going to count payments you've made towards in-network providers. So if you go out of network, you're going, uh, that's not gonna count towards your out-of-pocket maximum. Also, for some employer plans, they could carve out some of these things. So for example, my health insurance doesn't count payments I make towards my co-payments in my out-of-pocket maximum. So it's important to look to see what your specific policy considers for your out-of-pocket maximum. Now, I'd like to introduce you to Dan as a way to explain how all of this works. Dan has a health insurance policy with a $2,000 deductible, a co-insurance of 80-20, and an out-of-pocket maximum of $8,000. So far, Dan hasn't used any medical care for the year, but he gets into an accident and ends up with a $102,000 hospital bill. What does Dan have to pay? Well, the very first thing we always have to pay is that deductible. We subtract the deductible from the bill, leaving $100,000 left. Now, Dan has a policy with a 20% coinsurance. So 20% of $100,000 is $20,000. But does he have to pay that whole $20,000? No, he doesn't, because his plan has an out-of-pocket maximum of $8,000. So he's already paid $2,000 towards that out-of-pocket maximum. So he has to pay another $6,000 of the bill to get to his out-of-pocket maximum. And then his health insurance plan will pick up costs moving forward. Now, this is not to say that $8,000 isn't a lot of money. Of course it is. But when we look at the alternative of not having an out-of-pocket maximum and being left with $20,000, it's certainly better. And it is, considerably better than what would happen if Dan didn't have health insurance altogether and was responsible for that $102,000 hospital bill. So the reason that we say it's one of the most important things to know is that we can actually make some decisions and plan for the year based on understanding that out-of-pocket maximum. 
Now, if you would like to hear all of that again, so the terms and this example, that's included in one of our animated videos on health insurance basics. The video is available in English and Spanish, and it has Tagalog subtitles, and it's uh, downloadable for free on our website. Now, there are a whole set of terms that we need to know specifically around prescription drugs. Most health insurance policies that offer coverage for prescription drugs has something called a formulary, which is a list of drugs that the policy has said it's going to cover and at what rate it's going to cover those drugs. Typically, formularies are broken into categories known as tiers. Now, every policy is a little bit different, but this is a very common formulary structure where you'd have formulary generic, a non-formulary generic, all the way down to specialty drugs. Now, typically in tier one and two, you're going to pay less as a consumer than you would for drugs in a specialty tier. But the details are definitely going to vary plan to plan. Now, many oncology drugs do in fact fall into that specialty tier, so it's valuable for us to understand how our policies treat drugs in a specialty tier. So sometimes they don't have a co-payment, but rather they have a co-insurance, which means you're paying a percentage rather than a fixed dollar figure. Now, some plans also require something called step therapy, which means that the policy requires that you start with a prescription drug in a lower tier before you're allowed to step up to something in a higher tier. And generally you have to show that the drug in a lower tier, like a generic, isn't working for some reason. Now, if somebody is in a position where they have a plan with, with step therapy and their healthcare providers don't think they should start with the lower tier drug, there is something called an exception request, which is essentially an appeal, a request for the policy to make an exception and allow you to skip the step therapy. And we'll talk more about appeals in just a few minutes. Now, considering that I said most Americans get their health insurance from an employer, it begs the question, what happens when somebody needs to leave their job due to a cancer diagnosis and treatment? COBRA is the federal law that allows eligible employees to keep the exact same health insurance policy that they had when they were employed. The benefit to COBRA is it is the exact same policy. So somebody doesn't have to try to find a new policy with the same providers and the same prescription drug coverage. They don't have to meet their out-of-pocket maximums again. The downside is that it can be incredibly expensive because once somebody's on COBRA, they are now responsible for 100% of the premiums plus sometimes a 2% administrative fee. So it can be very expensive with respect to the premiums to elect COBRA. Now, COBRA is available to employees who work for an employer with 20 or more employees. And the length of time you can keep COBRA is going to depend on your qualifying event. Now, if your qualifying event is that you've left your job, or even if you've gone from full-time to part-time and your employer doesn't offer benefits to full-time employees, excuse me, to part-time employees, then you'd be eligible for up to 18 months of COBRA coverage. But let's say instead the reason you're losing employer coverage is because you're getting a divorce from the employee, you would be able to elect COBRA for up to 36 months. Now, generally, you have 60 days from the date of your qualifying event and notice to elect COBRA. Because of COVID-19, the Department of Labor has created an extension to that 60-day period. So if you have experienced a loss in coverage and for whatever reason you didn't elect COBRA and you're now outside of that 60 day period, you may actually still be able to go back and get COBRA coverage due to this COVID extension. Now I mentioned that COBRA only applies to employers with 20 or more employees. So that begs the question, what happens if somebody works for a smaller employer? 
In that case, they would want to look to see if their state had a state COBRA statute. And I know many of you are in Texas, and Texas does have a state COBRA statute, um, and it provides coverage for up to nine months. So if you work for a smaller employer of less than 20 employees, you're going to want to be looking at your Texas state law instead of the federal law. Now, a lot of times people will say to me, uh, why would anyone elect COBRA? It's so expensive. It would be better just to get a new policy. And that might be the case. But there are times when COBRA may be the better option. So certainly, if you have good coverage for your employer and it covers all of your providers and your drugs, um, that could be a reason by itself to keep COBRA. But also, if you are in a position where you've already met your deductible or your out-of-pocket maximum for the year, it may actually be more affordable to elect COBRA and know that all you're going to pay for the rest of the year are those monthly premiums. So it's important to not get sticker shock at those monthly premiums and really do the math of, well, what is this going to cost me for the entire year? So moving on to uh, some of the government insurance, since that's the next largest group of Americans. Medicare is a federally run um, insurance program for individuals who are over the age of 65 or have been receiving social security disability insurance two or more years. Or AL. Now, there are over 58 million people on Medicare. Uh, actually, it's more, it's more now even. So you would think that it would be easy to navigate Medicare given how many Americans are having to use it. That is not necessarily the case and Medicare can be incredibly confusing even for people who have had it for many years. Medicare is broken down to four parts and each part covers different things. So part A is your hospital insurance and it's going to cover uh, hospital stays, skilled nursing facilities, some home health. The cost for Medicare depends on how long you've worked and paid into the system. If you've worked at least 40 quarters, which if you work all year long is about 10 years, you're going to receive what's called premium free Medicare, part A. But if you haven't worked long enough, you can still access part A, you're just going to pay a monthly premium. Now there is a deductible and a cost share depending on your benefit periods and how long you're in patient. Now Medicare Part B is your medical insurance. And this is going to cover uh, doctor's visits and outpatient care and scans and home health care and sometimes even IV chemotherapy. So Medicare Part B covers what a lot of people think of as health insurance. Now, even if you've worked and paid into the system, there is still a monthly premium associated with Part B. Now, for most people this year, the premium is going to be $144.60. I say for most people because now Part B premiums are based on income. So if you make over a certain amount, you're going to pay more in premiums. There's also an annual deductible associated with Medicare, and for this year, it's $198. Medicare Part B is an 80-20 plan, which means that once you pay that $198 out of pocket for your deductible, Medicare starts picking up 80% of your healthcare costs and you're responsible for 20%. There is no out of pocket maximum with Medicare Part B. And that can be a significant challenge and contributor to financial toxicity, especially for people who are receiving IP, IV chemo that's covered under Part B because you're paying 20% of that chemotherapy every single time. We'll talk about how to address that in just a moment. Now, when we talk about Medicare Part A and Part B together, it's referred to as original Medicare because it was what existed when Medicare was originally signed. An original Medicare is fee for service, which means that you can go to any provider around the country that accepts Medicare and receive covered care. Now jumping over to Part D. Part D is prescription drug coverage that was added to Medicare in 2003. 
Part D plans are provided by private insurance companies, which means then every single plan is going to have a different premium, different co-payments, and potentially a different deductible. Now for 2020, the deductible for Part D plans cannot be more than $435. So some will have a, a lower deductible, but they just, that's the ceiling, it can't be more than that. Now, when Medicare was, Part D was passed, it was passed with a gap in coverage. And that gap in coverage was referred to as the donut hole. For me to explain where we are now, we have to step back in time to what the donut hole looked like prior to the passage of the Affordable Care Act. So prior to 2010, this is what the donut hole looked like. Someone would have to pay their deductible, which at the time was $295, so they pay that out of pocket. Then they enter the initial coverage phase. And during this time period, Medicare would pay 75% of the prescription drug costs and the patient would pay 25% until the total drug costs reached $2,700. Then they would enter the donut hole. And during the donut hole, Medicare paid nothing and the patient was responsible for 100% of their prescription drug costs until the total out-of-pocket drug costs reached $4,350. At that point, they entered the catastrophic coverage phase where Medicare paid 95% of the prescription drug costs and the patient paid 5% of the prescription drug costs or a nominal dollar figure, whichever was more. But when we're talking about cancer drugs, typically it's gonna be that 5%. So as you can see, there's this whole time period where the patient is responsible for 100% of their drug costs. And when you stop and think about the individuals who are receiving Medicare, it's seniors and individuals with disabilities who cannot work. So it's people, generally speaking, with fixed incomes. So coming up with this amount of money was a major problem. Now, the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, otherwise known as Obamacare or the ACA did several things to improve Medicare, including closing this coverage gap. And they closed it over a number of years. And as of this year, it is completely closed. So as of 2020, this is how Part D coverage works. You pay your $435 deductible, deductible out of pocket. Then you enter that initial coverage phase during which Medicare pays 75% of your prescription drug costs and the patient pays 25% until the total out-of-pocket drug costs reach $6,350. And then you're in that catastrophic coverage phase where Medicare pays 95% and the patient pays 5%. So as you can see, there's now coverage all the way through your Part D. Now you might be wondering, okay, well, if this is where we are now, why did she bother telling me about what it was like prior to the ACA? And the reason is, is that right now there is a court case pending in front of the Supreme Court challenging the constitutionality of the Affordable Care Act. And if the Supreme Court strikes down the Affordable Care Act, this is one of the many things that goes away and we go back to a situation where there is that donut hole and that gap in coverage. So it's important to recognize um, sort of what's at stake. So we've talked about part A, which is hospital insurance, part B, which is medical insurance, part D, which is prescription drug coverage. Now we're gonna talk about part C. Part C is also known as Medicare Advantage plans. And these Advantage plans are an alternative to electing Part A and Part B separately. These are managed care plans. So they're going to be HMOs or PPOs. All of the services you would get under Part A and Part B are bundled into one plan that is more similar to what many of us are used to in like an employer plan. Now, 90% of all Part C plans also include prescription drug coverage. Um, and these again are sold by private insurance companies, 
but they have to meet certain standards in order to be called an Advantage plan. Now the cost for these Part C plans are going to vary because again, the plans are sold by private companies and so they're going to vary plan to plan. But you're going to pay at least that usual Part B premium. And so there's some confusion sometimes because you'll see Advantage plans being advertised as premium free Advantage plans. And so people think, well, why would I pick up Part B where I have to pay a premium? Why wouldn't I get a Advantage plan where it's free? And it's a little bit deceiving because it's not actually free. You're still gonna pay that Part B premium. It just means that you're not gonna pay anything above that Part B premium. Now the deductibles and cost shares are gonna vary plan to plan, but with Advantage plans, there is an out-of-pocket maximum. And in 2020, the out-of-pocket maximum cannot be more than $6,700. This is typically when we're in person where people will say to me, well, which is better? Original Medicare or Medicare Advantage? And my answer is, it depends. It depends on your needs and it depends on your situation. So certainly there are pros and cons to every decision. One of the major benefits to an Advantage plan is there is that out-of-pocket maximum. And when we compare that with Part B, where you have a 20% coinsurance and no out-of-pocket maximum, that could be a significant savings. The downside is that Advantage plans are gonna have a smaller network of providers. So unlike original Medicare, where it's fee for service and you can go to any provider in the country, with Advantage plans, you're gonna have that more limited network of providers. So I live in Chicago and many people will often spend part of the year here in Chicago and part of the year, let's say in Florida. For those individuals, having an Advantage plan would be challenging because they wouldn't half the year, they wouldn't be able to see providers in their network. So it really just depends um, and there's no one size fits all. Now, for individuals that choose Medicare Parts A and Parts B and are concerned about, well, what do I do about that 20% coinsurance? One way to address that or the way to address that is by purchasing an additional plan called a Medigap plan, also known as a Medicare Supplemental plan. So here we are, another situation where there's two names for exactly the same thing and it just causes more confusion. Now these Medigap plans help pick up the out-of-pocket costs that arise when somebody's in original Medicare. So things like that 20% coinsurance. The challenge with these Medigap plans is they are identified by letters A through N. Not to be confused with Medicare parts A through D. So I don't know why we couldn't come up with any other naming system to make this less confusing, but here's where we are. We will often get phone calls with people saying to me, you know, I have Medicare Part F um, and we will have to explain, you probably don't. Um, what I think you have is a Medigap plan, um, but it is confusing. So if you are confused, please feel free to ask questions. Medigap plans C and F were the most comprehensive plans available. And that's because they picked up the Part B deductible and the Part B coinsurance, that 20%. Now, for people who became newly eligible for Medicare this year, Plan C and F are no longer available for purchase. If you've had Medicare and you've already had a C and F plan, you can keep those plans. You just can't pick it up if you're new this year. So then people typically ask, well, what's the next best plan? And plan G has the next highest amount of coverage. It just doesn't pick up that part B deductible. So to summarize Medicare, because I know it's confusing, when somebody's trying to make decisions around Medicare options, they have two lanes they can drive in. The first lane is original Medicare, where you pick up part A for your hospital insurance and part B for your medical insurance. 
Then you decide if you want a prescription drug plan in Part D. Then you decide if you want to pick up a Medigap plan to help cover or supplement those out-of-pocket costs you're going to incur with Part A and Part B. So that's lane one. Lane two is picking Medicare Advantage, otherwise known as Part C. And in that Advantage plan, you're gonna get your Part A and Part B services bundled together. And if you're in one of the plans, the Advantage plans that doesn't cover prescription drugs, you can pick up a Part D plan. And that's where it ends in Lane 2. You cannot get a Medigap plan if you're driving in Lane 2. And the reason for that is Lane 2 comes with an out-of-pocket maximum. So I recognize it's a lot and it's confusing and I can see the chat box flaring up, so I'm sure there's gonna be some questions, but I did just wanna mention that Triage Cancer has lots of resources on Medicare. So uh, later this month, we're going to be doing a free hour-long webinar just on Medicare, where we're gonna go into the weeds. If you can't wait until September, we have our uh, webinar from last year archived on our website. We also have several quick guides, which are one to two page handouts that you can download and print from our website totally for free on Medicare and Medigap and also some financial assistance options in Medicare as well. So I just want you to know that this isn't your last opportunity to get Medicare information. So now I want to switch into private insurance. And we've talked a little bit about the ACA already, um, and that's because it really is every of our health system until 2013 and 10, and was slowly implemented with some of the biggest changes coming in 2014. The ACA has experienced um, lots of growing pains for several reasons. And while it is certainly not a perfect piece of legislation, it did some really important things for us as healthcare consumers, particularly those in the cancer community. And so some of the things that it did is it said that individual insurance and small group health plans have to provide coverage for these 10 categories of care. And these are referred to as essential health benefits. And so it's what most of us think that our insurance should cover. Ambulatory care, ER, prescription drugs, lab services. Every state's a little bit different, but again, generally speaking, it has to cover this stuff. It has to be adequate. Also, we have to address how confusing health insurance is. And one of the ways it did that, the ACA did that, was it created this summary of benefits and coverage, or an SBC. This blue and white checkered format probably looks familiar to you. Um, this SBC is gonna provide some of the really key pieces of information about a health insurance plan. What's the deductible? Is there an out-of-pocket limit? And if there is, what's covered in that out-of-pocket limit? Is there a network of providers? Do I need a referral to see a specialist? So it's all of the things that we talked about in those terms of what you need to know about your plan is provided to you in this SBC. Now, what is so beneficial about this is that if someone is trying to make a decision between two different policies from two different companies, before the ACA, that information wasn't necessarily easy to find. And it certainly wasn't easy to compare oranges to oranges and apples to apples. And so now by standardizing the format, someone can print out an SBC from Humana and one from Blue Cross Blue Shield and put them next to each other and literally compare across the rows. So for consumers, it really makes it a little easier. The ACA also provided a whole host of consumer protections and benefits. And these protections and benefits aren't just for people who have to go buy their own insurance. They apply to many employer plans as well. So things like making sure there aren't lifetime or annual limits on what they're going to pay out for care, making sure that they're not going to cancel your policy once you get a cancer diagnosis, making sure that certain preventative services like cancer screenings are provided for free. Um, which means that you cannot be charged a deductible or a copay. 
So it's trying to um, get that early detection piece to be more affordable for individuals. The ACA also created a new way for us to shop for health insurance, and they did that through the state health insurance marketplaces. When the law was first passed, these were referred to as exchanges. Turns out no one knows what an exchange is, so we called them marketplaces. Turns out that's still confusing. Essentially, it is a shopping mall for health insurance. The policies being sold in these marketplaces are being sold by private health insurance companies. So in our triangle of coverage, they're sitting up there at the top. So you might be wondering, well, why would I go back through the marketplace when I could just go straight to the insurance company? And the reason is, is there are some benefits and protections to buying policies through the marketplace. One of the benefits is that plans sold in the marketplace cannot have an out-of-pocket maximum more than $8,150 for individuals or $16,300 for a family. Now, again, these are expensive out-of-pocket maximums. I recognize that, but when we start talking and comparing it with cancer care costs, it all starts to become a little bit more relative. I will also say in the last three years, we've seen the largest jumps year to year in the cap on out-of-pocket maximums. So we hope that that won't continue to occur. The other benefit to purchasing through the marketplace is there may be some financial assistance to buying a plan in the marketplace. Financial assistance is based on household size and income level, and there's two different types. So one type is going to reduce what you pay monthly just to get health insurance. The other type is a cost sharing reduction. So it's going to reduce what you're paying for things like your deductible or your co-payments. Now, What's really challenging for us as educators in this space is many people will come to us that don't have health insurance and we will ask them, why didn't you buy a plan in the marketplace? And they often say things like this to us. I didn't think I could afford it. I didn't think I needed it. I didn't even know a marketplace existed. But we also know that about half of the Americans that are currently uninsured in this country could get a plan in the marketplace for free. So when we're talking about reducing financial toxicity and minimizing that financial burden, this is one of the ways that we can do that. Now, the last type of plan I wanna talk about quickly are short-term plans. These are plans that last less than a calendar year and they were supposed to be phased out and eliminated under the ACA. Uh, in 2008, Health and Human Services issued a regulation expanding the availability of these short-term plans. The challenge with these plans is that because they last less than a year, they don't have to comply with the ACA's consumer protections, and they can exclude whole categories of care. So we will get phone calls for people saying, my insurance isn't covering my chemotherapy, and we say, wait, that's not allowed. Oh, do you have a short-term plan? And almost always that's the case. So people buy these plans because they seem very affordable in their monthly premiums, but then they go to use them and they have incredibly high out of pocket costs or they don't cover anything. They also can end mid year and they don't trigger an ability to buy a new plan. And so then people are left uninsured with very little options. And so we really just want people to be aware that these short term plans exist. Um, and if they're considering purchasing one, really thinking long and hard about if that is a smart decision. Now, unfortunately, picking health insurance is not a one-time chore. We actually have to be reviewing our options every single year. And again, when we're talking about minimizing financial toxicity in someone who has high out-of-pocket costs this year, one of the ways to make sure that that toxicity is mitigated is to pick a better plan for them for the coming year. And thankfully, now thanks to the ACA, we have some options to do that every single year. But when you can enroll is going to depend on what type of insurance you have. So Medicaid applications are accepted year round. So as soon as you become eligible, you can submit your application. For marketplaces, you have to uh, typically purchase during open enrollment. 
Open enrollment happens in the year prior. So for plans for 2021, open enrollment will be from November 1st to December 15th of this year for most states, including Texas. Some states run their own marketplaces and could have open enrollment periods longer, and we have that information on our chart of state laws. Now, Medicare also has an annual open enrollment period from October 15th to December 7th. Marketplace plans and Medicare plans are calendar year plans, which means that even if somebody picks a plan on the first day of open enrollment, that plan doesn't start until January 1st of 2021. So very important to make sure we maintain coverage until the end of the year. Now, if you have an employer plan, uh, usually there's an annual enrollment. Most employers do their annual enrollment in the fall to match up with the calendar, but you should check with your employers specifically. Now, thankfully, the ACA recognized that things don't just change during open enrollment. So they created a special enrollment period. And this is when somebody has a life-changing event that results in either losing essential minimum coverage or a change in where they live or their family. Something that's gonna impact your eligibility for insurance. If that happens, you get 60 days to enroll in a marketplace plan. So what that means now is that if someone were to lose their employer-sponsored coverage, which is, happens in the cancer context anyway, but is certainly happening more and more frequently now because of COVID-19, somebody actually has more options than they've ever had in the past. So the first option might be to pick COBRA or a state COBRA policy and keep their exact same employer-sponsored insurance. The second option would be to buy a totally new plan in the marketplace, special enrollment. Maybe, based on their situation, they are eligible to join another group plan, like going on a spouse's plan at work, or if they're under the age of 26, going on a parent's plan. Or maybe now, because of the change in circumstances, they're eligible for Medicaid or Medicare. The trick with this though, is that you have to pick a lane and stay in it. You don't get to change lanes until the next open enrollment period. And this is important because what we see happening is somebody leaves their job, they're overwhelmed, they pick up COBRA, they're a few months into COBRA and they think, I can't pay these premiums or the plan doesn't meet my needs, I wanna go buy a marketplace plan. And unfortunately, out of that 60 day, period, that's not an option anymore until the next open enrollment period. Now, if you want more information about losing employer-sponsored health insurance, we have a quick guide um, downloadable on our website. And by the uh, middle of this month, we will also have an animated video on this as well. So, this all, again, sort of brings up the question, okay, I have more options potentially than I've ever had before. How do I actually make choices? I'm gonna give you an example using the marketplace, so healthcare.gov, but this analysis that I'm about to give you works whether you're trying to compare two marketplace options, whether you're trying to compare two plans offered to you from an employer, whether you're trying to decide, do I take my employer plan or do I pick a marketplace plan? Or even if you're trying to decide between Medicare plans, this analysis works in all of these situations. So here are three plans that are available to me. A bronze plan with $173 monthly premium, a $6,000 deductible, and a $6,000 out-of-pocket maximum. A silver plan, that's about $100 more a month with a $2,500 deductible and a $5,200 out-of-pocket maximum. And then a platinum plan with an almost $400 a month premium, a $0 deductible, and a $1,150 out-of-pocket maximum. So I'm trying to decide, well, which plan is going to cost me the least for the year, assuming that I'm going to hit that out-of-pocket maximum? Now, when we're talking about cancer care, chances are you're gonna hit that out-of-pocket maximum. I can't tell just by looking at this. I actually have to do the math. And the way that you do the math 
is you take that monthly premium, you multiply it by 12, because that's how much the premiums are gonna cost you for the year, and then you add the out-of-pocket maximum. And when you do that for all three of these plans, in this example, you see that that platinum plan with the $400 a month premium ends up being over $2,000 cheaper come the end of the year. Now, I will tell you, we do these presentations and these examples all over the country throughout the year, and it never turns out the same twice. The point is just that we often, as consumers, get sticker shock by that high monthly premium, but that doesn't always tell us the full story, and so we really have to do this math. Now, in addition to doing the math of what it's going to cost us for the whole year, we also have to make sure that our providers are covered under the insurance plan. Otherwise, it's a pretty useless insurance plan. It's also helpful to see what prescription drug coverage is available in that plan. If you would like to hear that example again, or there's somebody that you think might benefit from hearing that, we have a animated video, six minutes long, just on how to pick a health insurance plan. And I'm really harping on that because we're coming up to open enrollment and this is the time when many of us can make some different decisions for the year coming. But here's the thing, even if you have a great health insurance policy and you've done the math and you've done all the things I've talked about, you may still end up receiving a denial from your insurance company. And if that happens, we want you to know that you don't necessarily have to take no for an answer and that you actually have the right to appeal that decision. Generally speaking, there are two different types of appeals. There's an internal appeal where you go back to the insurance company, please reconsider. An external appeal, yes. States had this ACA. The ACA required that all states now have an external appeals process. And this is where you go to an independent external entity, provide your evidence as to why the service was medically necessary and ask them to rule on whether or not the insurance company should have covered it. Now here's the interesting piece about appeals. We know that somewhere between 40 and 60% of all appeals are decided in favor of the patient. So conservatively, that means about 50% of the time the insurance company is getting it wrong when they deny a claim. But of all the claims that are denied, less than half a percentage are actually appealed. So when we're talking about financial toxicity and the cost of care and the financial burden of a cancer diagnosis, and we see that 41 million claims are denied, but less than 200,000 of them are appealed. And half the time the insurance company is getting it wrong, we know that the appeal system isn't adequately being utilized. So we think it is very important for individuals who have been diagnosed and caregivers to work with their healthcare teams to appeal claim denials. Um, it is absolutely an added burden for the patient. That's not necessarily fair. Um, but again, when we're talking about how do we minimize financial impact, this is an underutilized resource. I also just wanted to mention that appeals are available in the Medicare context as well. Now, how do we deal with medical costs? I mean, certainly we've talked about appealing claim denials. There are some financial assistance options, and we have those listed on our website, uh, cancerfinances.org. I also have to give a shout out to the pharmaceutical companies because many of them have fantastic patient assistance programs. Certainly, we could pick differently during our next open enrollment period, and we have resources to hopefully help you do that. The other piece of this is that Health insurance, as I mentioned at the beginning of the hour, is only part of the puzzle. And there are a whole host of other cancer-related legal issues that can play in to finances. And this is just a screenshot from the Triage Cancer website um, on our page, Resources by Topic, that shows you all of the different topics that we have resources available 
uh, to you. And all of our resources are available for free. I also just wanted to mention that if you are interested in learning more about these topics, Triage Cancer hosts can't tri our triage cancer conferences, excuse me, <clears throat> uh, because of COVID-19, they are all virtual this year. And we have two coming up uh, for the remainder of the year. Uh, totally free to attend. Anybody is welcome. We do provide free CEs for social workers and nurses as well. You just have to go to our website and register. We also have a monthly webinar series. The next two are going to be about Medicare and then how to choose your health insurance. So right before leading up to open enrollment, we'll be talking about these issues again and again, free to attend, free CEs. Um, a reminder about our animated videos, and these aren't just available for individuals who have been diagnosed, but we also have a new one on the rights and supporting for caregivers. Now, I am going to take some questions. I just wanted to mention two final resources we have that might be helpful to you. We host a totally separate website called cancerfinances.org where it's sort of a choose your own adventure. So you can go on this website, pick a topic, the website will pose questions to you and then based on your answers, it will take you to tailored information. So if you're on Medicare, you don't have to sort through information about the marketplaces. And then finally, because there is a lot of late breaking news, especially around COVID and rights of employees and health insurance options, as well as what's going on in the health insurance arena around the ACA and other issues, we have an educational blog where we post uh, late breaking news um, and we try to really distill the news as to why it is uh, going to impact the cancer community. Uh, so with all of that, I'll turn it back over to Kelly um, to answer as many questions as we have time for. Awesome. Thank you, Monica, so much. I, we got a comment on, as we've been streaming on Facebook just saying, I'm so glad we're talking about this. This topic just makes my head spin, and I agree with that. And so <laughs> I'm learning so much today. So thank you for just taking the time to prepare and just share about this. My pleasure. Um, so yeah, we did have a few questions coming in, um, so I'm just going to start going through them and we'll get through as many as we can. Um, and everyone in our audience, please continue to use that Q&A tab um, on your webinar page, um, send them in and we will get through as many as we can. Um, so first of all, one question we received was people who have Medicare A and B and Medicaid do they also need to purchase the Advantage plan? And I know you talked about that, but maybe you could just clarify it once more. Sure, so remember the two lanes. So the, the first lane is part A and part B, um, and that's the lane where you could pick up a Medigap plan, also called a supplemental plan, and that's to help with those out-of-pocket costs. If somebody is what's often referred to as dual eligible, which means they're eligible for Medicare and for Medicaid based on having a low income and asset level, and they're eligible for both, Medicaid often will act as a Medigap plan and pick up those out-of-pocket costs associated with Part A and Part B. So for somebody who has Medicare and Medicaid, they generally do not need to buy a Medigap plan. Okay, awesome. Yeah, thank you for clarifying that. I know it's confusing, which is why yeah. I wanted to give additional places to go for information. Absolutely, yes. Um, which everyone's been super grateful that you've been sharing all these additional sites and resources. So thank you for incorporating that in your presentation. Of course. Um, so one question that came in while you were showing the Medigap donut hole um, picture was manufacturing contributing to the cost share during the initial coverage, will that go away? You cut out for just a second. Could you repeat the question? So sorry. Um, so during that donut hole uh, image that you shared with us, we got a question asking manufacturers contribute, contribute to the cost share during that initial coverage, but does that go away during that donut hole phase? 
So I, what I think they're referring to is um, one of the ways that Part D was able to close that donut hole was by getting the manufacturers to chip in more of the money, and that is in the ACA. So theoretically, uh, if the ACA is struck down as unconstitutional, that would also go away. Um, but it's really, it's really not so simple, um, to be honest, because given how much the ACA is intertwined with all aspects of our healthcare system, uh, those of us that do this on a daily basis just really can't wrap our heads around how you unring that bell. Um, so theoretically, Congress would have to write and pass uh, new legislation to keep that piece in if the ACA were ruled unconstitutional. Okay. Um, another question we received was, do you just have any insight on copay accumulators? Um, I, I have thoughts about them. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but I'm not sure we have time for me to share all of those thoughts today. But if someone really has a specific question, they can always reach out by email to me and I'd be happy to try to answer that question. Awesome. Um, and then, so as you were talking about the appeal process, um, how long does this typically take? What do individuals do in the meantime? Do they proceed with the medical needs or the prescriptions that they were needing while the appeal's going on? Or do they have to wait until that process is completed? So that's a really great question and it's addressed. We have a quick guide on appeals that has a chart with all the timing, but generally speaking, if somebody is filing an internal appeal, they have to file that within 180 days of receiving treatment. Um, and then the insurance company has to give a decision depending on what type of appeal it is within a specified period of time. There is also an opportunity for somebody to get an expedited appeal or an urgent appeal. Um, and that means that the insurance company has to give an answer within 72 hours. Now, typically what happens is an appeal happens after someone's already gotten care. So what we generally recommend is that the patient communicate with their healthcare provider as to what's happening. I have filed an appeal, I'm waiting for a decision. Most of the time, the providers are very understanding about this because it happens so often and they will continue to provide treatment or help the patient with the appeals process and certainly they won't send bills to collections if they know somebody's appealing the decision. Okay, okay. Um, lastly, this is just um, going back to COBRA. Um, so can you just speak and just elaborate on this, but COBRA covers pre-existing diseases, correct? Or would they need to, or just speak to that? <laughs> sure. So, so, okay. So <laughs> one of the major things that the ACA did was it said that insurance companies can no longer deny or charge somebody more based on a pre-existing condition. Similar rights existed in the employment setting under HIPAA prior to the ACA. So if somebody's going into an employer plan, generally speaking, they can't be denied based on a pre-existing condition. It's important to remember when we're talking about COBRA, COBRA isn't actually a plan itself. It's just the right to keep the exact same employer plan that you had when you would normally lose it. So because that employer plan can't deny someone based on a pre-existing condition, if they've elected COBRA and they're keeping that same plan, then there isn't a worry about pre-existing conditions. That would remain in place even if the ACA were ruled unconstitutional because that's actually under two different federal laws. Okay. That clarified that. Yeah, no, that did. I was really glad you spoke about that further. <laughs> Awesome. Well, I want to remain mindful of everyone's time that's viewing in. So thank you for all the comments and questions that you guys shared with us. Monica, we are so grateful for your time in preparation and presenting this information. Um, so I just want to thank you again. Well, thank you so much for having me. It was my pleasure. Um, and for everyone viewing with us today, thank you for joining and participating live. A reminder that this session was recorded and it will be sent out to everyone who registered um, in our follow-up emails. 
And in that follow-up email, you are also going to see a survey. We would love your feedback. Let us know um, about today's presentation, your thoughts um, and opinions, and also share with us what you would like to hear in the future. Um, so we value your opinion and we would love your feedback on that. Um, I just want to encourage everyone to stay connected with our foundation, either by visiting our website or um, like us on Facebook and follow us there. We are continuing our Survive and Thrive webinar series. Our next live session is actually going to be on a Wednesday, which is not typical for us, but on September 23rd. Um, we are going to be hosting a Texas Oncology Medical Panel, and so tune in live for that. Um, and on our Facebook page, we have also been doing watch parties, and so our uh, just had one last week on August 27th. Um, Vanessa Pettijohn, one of our Texas Oncology social workers, um, presented on the fear of reoccurrence, and so you can find this video on our timeline and just be looking on our Facebook page for uh, future presentations. Um, we are just thankful for our community and glad that we can still connect virtually during this year. And so I just want to thank you all for joining us and have a wonderful afternoon.